Hi friends, welcome back to Book Club with Ms. Deb. Today we're going to be reading chapter 21 from Solomar, The Sword of the Monarchs by Pam Munoz Ryan. So let's jump into it. Chapter 21, El Gran Mercado. In the faintest morning light, Solomar tied the rebozo safely under the blue work shirt, slipped Zarita into the chest pocket and pulled a knit cap over her head and ears. She picked up the banana leaf and studied it. I don't want to draw attention to myself. And this basically screams, look at me, said Zarita. I agree, said Berto. To be safe, we should all try to be as inconspicuous as possible. He pointed at Zarita. Zarita crossed her heart. Lazaro landed on Solomar's shoulder. She reached up to pet him. The guards are looking for you too. You need to hide and no singing. You can follow us tree to tree. Lazaro nuzzled her hand, then flew to a nearby oak, almost completely concealing himself in the leafy branches. It will be overcast for a few hours, said Berto. Then we'll stay in the shade as much as possible. Solomar tossed the banana leaf aside and followed Berto, clomping along in the boots that were still a little too large, even with extra socks. So, Solomar, how exactly are we going to do this? Is there a plan? said Berto. Solomar's brow furrowed. We know that my father and Campayon are both being watched, and King of Hano's guards and spies will be alerted to anyone who's curious about their whereabouts. So we can't just ask around. Zarita popped up from the pocket. We don't know who is a friend or a foe. True, said Berto. We can't trust anyone. First, we need to find the tent where San Gregorio is selling their goods and watch for my father and brother, said Salomar. Then follow them and hopefully figure out how to get a message to them. What do you think? It's as good a plan as any, said Berto. All morning as they hiked through the foothills, they didn't pass anyone except for a farmer herding sheep and a few stray dogs. By midday, though, they had reached the road to town and encountered more foot traffic and the occasional wagon or cart. They crossed over to the shady side of the road, but the more people they passed face to face, the more Solomar confi Solomar's confidence faded. She felt self-conscious, convinced that everyone was a spy and would recognize her. Every polite nod or cheerful hello made her panic. For the rest of the afternoon, Solomar kept close to Berto with her head down and avoiding any eye contact with strangers. When they stopped for a moment's rest, she asked, how much farther to Puerto Rivera? It's taking longer than I thought, said Berto. If we had horses, we'd be there by now. Don't worry, we'll make it in time. I hope you're right, she said, but doubts crowded her thoughts. It was dusk by the time they reached Puerto Rivera and the center of Main Street. Berto pointed toward half a dozen young men crowded around a public notice board, the port of call sailings. Solomar edged into the crowd until she was close enough to read it. She scanned down the list of ships. Her heart jumped when she saw La Quinta. She hurried to Berta. La Quinta sells at dawn, and they're soliciting deckhands, just like Campayon said. That means he will sneak away sometime late tonight as planned. Good, this way, said Berto, pointing toward the end of the street where the colored tents loomed. Solomar froze as two of King Avano's uniformed guards came toward them. Berto moved closer to her and muttered, keep walking. But Solomar panicked and spun around to run, bumping into a woman and upending her shopping bag. I'm so sorry, cried Solomar. The guards walked by, paying no attention to her. Berto picked up, picked up the goods and handed them back to the woman and then pulled Solomar aside. I thought the idea was not to draw attention. Solomar's eyes darted at each person on the road. I'm sorry, I'm just nervous. There's not much time and King of Vano's guards could be anyone and anywhere. But they're not looking for us, said Berto. Breathe in, breathe out, whispered Zarita. Portray calm and confidence and no one will be the wiser. Besides, people are focused on themselves. Berto nodded, ditto to what she said. Solomar took a deep breath and looked around. Everyone did seem to be going about their business without giving them a second look. Try to look casual, said Berto. Casual, she repeated. Nonchalant, he added. Like I don't have a care in the world, she tried to smile, but it was half-hearted. When they finally entered the main aisle of El Gran Mercado, they paused to take it all in. 
It was more like a grand fiesta than a grand marketplace, and the party was in full swing. Even though it wasn't yet dark, lanterns already aglow crisscrossed the aisles from the tops of the tents and swayed in the gentle breeze. Guitars strummed, the delicious aroma of food cooking wafted in the air, and vendors called out to anyone walking in the aisle to buy something. El Gran Mercado was a concert of people talking, bartering, eating, laughing, and clapping to music. Solomar relaxed a little. It was much easier to disappear within the milling crowds than it had been on the main road. Here, everyone was preoccupied. She and Berto walked up the center row slowly, stopping briefly at each booth as if they were shoppers. A woman wearing a long apron stepped from a stall holding a bowl of watermelon, papaya, and pineapple chunks sprinkled with chili powder and salt crystals. A bamboo pick was stuck in the pyramid of fruit. She offered it to Solomar. For you, young man? Solomar's mouth watered, but her stomach cramped. She reached out to take it, but remembered she had no money. Jerking her hand back, she said, no, thank you. That was close, whispered Berto, taking her elbow and steering her away. I know, whispered Solomar. She would have yelled thief and all eyes would have been on us. Better to stay focused on the task at hand. Let's find San Gregorio's tent. Solomar stopped and slowly turned. The market was a dizzying panorama of color and people and flags. If I could just get up higher. When they reached the end of the aisle, Berto considered a large pile of empty crates. I can fix that. He quickly upturned them and made a base and then stacked them against a pole in four levels in stair fashion. I'll steady them so they don't wobble. Solomar scrambled up and gazed across the tent tops. The market was massive and with row upon row of vendors. When she spotted San Gregorio's flag, she was overwhelmed with a yearning for home. Tears filled her eyes. Father and Campayon, she whispered. They were so close. She clambered down, six rows over. Salomar and Berto sat at one of the many picnic tables crowded beneath open air tents on a grassy area across from San Gregorio's tent. From this spot, they had a good view of who went in and out. Salomar studied their setup, the huge tent lined with shelves filled with menucas de trapo, table upon table of butterfly themed arts and crafts, racks of jackets and shawls embroidered with monarchs. But she didn't see father or Campayon. A man carrying mesh bags filled with groceries and heading toward a foot tent, a, a food tent, struggled by them. He stopped to shift the weight. Berto jumped up. Senor, can I help you? Oh, si, por favor. Your kindness will be repaid. Berto leaned toward Solomar and winked. That's what I'm counting on. I'll be right back. A few minutes later, he returned, grinning with two burritos and kicking a ball in front of him. Amazed, she shook her head. Still borrowing things? He gave me the food for helping him and asked if I wanted the ball too. Said it had been left behind days ago and he had no use for it. It might come in handy. They ate quickly, keeping an eye on the San Gregorio tent. Any sign of your father or brother? asked Berto. Solomar shook her head. So far, it's just villagers who are working and customers roaming the tent. We need to find the encampment. It would be a site where they could corral the animals away from the market, but close enough to walk back and forth. When I helped the man with his groceries, I noticed a road behind the tents. He grabbed the ball. I'll show you. They slowly wandered down the road in one direction until they reached a dead end. They doubled back until they had almost reached the edge of the forest, kicking the ball between them, passing any number of campsites, until Solomar stopped and nodded to Berto. San Gregorio's encampment was an enclave down a wide dirt path at the far end of the grassy field. The entire site was surrounded on three sides by forested hills. At the edge of the grass, Solomar and Berto paused and kept the ball moving between them so they could get a good look at the camp. A dozen tents dotted the side, the largest bearing the royal crest. Stakes and ropes penned the horses and donkeys in temporary corrals, and the dogs were tethered on long ropes beneath the surrounding trees. Several villagers milled about, tending a fire and feeding the animals. Berto passed the ball to Solomar and raised his eyebrows. 
Do you see them? She shook her head, picked up the ball, and came closer. Don't be too obvious, but check out the other side of the road. Berto glanced across the way where two men sat at a tall barrel at the back of a tent. They appeared to be playing cards, but with a keen eye on the field and San Gregorio's sight. A little farther away, it was the same thing. Two card players who were more interested in what was going on in the encampment than their game. Berto whispered, Aveno's guards. Salomar pulled the knit cap lower. Let's go somewhere else. When they were far enough away, Salomar stopped and rubbed her forehead. We'll never get in there unnoticed. And even if we did, Juan Pedro said there were spies everywhere. My father thinks he's going to the secret meeting with Campeon tomorrow morning, but Campeon will already have left on the ship at dawn, and he's the only one who can get a message to father. We need to intercept Campeon. If he sticks to his original plan, he will leave to board La Quinta tonight after father goes to sleep. Won't the guards see him, said Berto? Salomar shook her head. He disguises himself and knows how to slip out without anyone noticing. And, she paused, smiling, there's only one road that leads to the harbor. Salomar and Berto found a sheltered spot on the forested side of the road to the harbor. They were hidden, but there was enough moonlight to see anyone heading their way toward the ship and do ships and docks. Lazaro, their lookout, perched in a tree. They'd been waiting since midnight, and with each passing minute, Solomar's hopes of diverting Campeon dwindled. Maybe he was caught trying to leave camp by King Aveno's guards, said Berto. Let's think positive, said Zarita. Solomar shook her head. No, he'd be extra careful tonight. He's been waiting for this chance for a long time. As the night wore on and Campeon didn't appear, Salomar's mind raced with all that might have happened. He could have changed his mind, but in her heart, she didn't think he would. Father could have woken when he was leaving, but that didn't seem likely. If Campeon didn't show up, then what? The worry and emotion of the last few days gripped Salomar. She sat on the ground next to a tree and leaned her head back. Relax, said Zarita. Laz will alert us. I can't, said Solomar. Solomar sighed. I'm too worried. Listen to the sound of my voice, said Zarita. Imagine all your troubles on a puffy cloud floating away from you. Isn't that lovely? Now close your eyes and breathe in to the count of four. One, two, three three, four, and out, two, three, four. That's it. Zarita's voice droned on. A blanket of fatigue covered Solomar until finally she dozed. She startled awake when Berto shook her arm. Lazaro, Lazaro whistled, somebody's coming. Solomar stood up. The road was empty except for a lone figure in the distance walking toward them. The person wore rumpled work clothes and a wide-brimmed straw hat and carried an old mesh shopping bag. It could have been a stable hand or a vendor from the marketplace. As they drew closer, Solomar didn't need to see their face to recognize who it was. Campeon's stride gave him away. She nodded to Berto. Berto stepped into the road. Hey there, are you heading to La Quinta? Campeon stopped. Hello. Did you sign up too? Yes, said Berto. Then he lowered his voice. But not for what you think. Prince Campeon, right? Campeon looked around to see if anyone was near. Who are you? And how did you know my name? Did my father send you? Because, no, not your father. Berto stepped closer. Your sister, Solomar. Come with me. Campeon jerked back. What is this? Some sort of trick? I have nothing of value. No, no, nothing like that. Berto held his arm out to the side and whistled. Lazaro swooped down and landed on his hand. Campion's eyes widened. Lazaro, where is she? Berto nodded toward the side of the road. Solomar stepped out from the bushes and pulled off the knit cap. Solly! Campion leapt to her, hugging her tight. How? What are you doing here? Wait, why are you dressed like that? 
She pulled him into their hiding spot behind the trees and bushes where Zarita waited, poised on a log. Hi, I'm Zarita. She patted the spot next to her. Sit down. Campayon hesitated and looked at Berto. There's no time to get used to her, Berto. Trust us, she's a friend. Just listen, said Salomar. I'll explain everything. Campayon warily lowered himself next to a grinning Zarita. Salomar recounted everything that had happened and what was at stake. Campayon's emotions echoed her own. The surprise about the magic, the anguish about their mother and grandmother and the hostages, the frustration and anger at King Aveno's plans to capture him and father and Solomar, and the quiet resolve and determination to put their heads together and come up with a plan. Campayon drew a map of the encampment and the surrounding areas in the dirt, pointing out key places and the route to the secret meeting. We will need help. I'm going to the captain of La Quinta. She is fair and respected. If she could spare some sailors for a few days, father would be indebted to her. I think this captain would welcome having a king in her good graces. Then I'll sneak back into the encampment to brief father. Salomar repeated everyone's roles. Campeon, reinforcements. Berto, scouting. Lazaro and Zarita, diversionary tactics and I will oversee and try to avoid being spotted until it's my time. It's a worthy strategy, said Zarita. If it works, yes, said Salomar. If not, we've lost everything. That's the end of chapter 21. Thank you so much for stopping by and joining us for Solomar, The Sword of the Monarchs by Pam Munoz Ryan. Don't forget that voting is coming up very soon. It uh, might actually even be in progress right now, but I know it goes through part of February. I'll figure out the exact dates and post those in the description um, in case you want to vote for this as a Texas Blue Bonnet Award book. Um, and I hope that you will um, give this video a thumbs up. Please subscribe if you're not already subscribed and um, ring the notification bell so you can see when I add new chapters and new books to our channel. Thank you so much uh, for being part of our read aloud community and I can't wait to read again with you soon. Bye!